time for initiative. So let's roll our dice, hope for a crit, and today we're making Dwarven Mead. Yes, so today we're making Dwarven Mead. So if you don't know what a dwarf is, a dwarf is a fantasy creature from some tabletop games, some Middle Earth type stuff, you know, that kind of nerdy realm. That, yes. Um, I love it, and I wanted to make a mead inspired by it, so I picked dwarfs because they have a really fun backstory. Uh, most of the time they live in more rough terrain type areas, mountains, mines, things of that nature. Uh, not the easiest life. And when I was trying to find anything about their mead, uh, it really took me all over the place. I actually have some notes because I wanted to make sure I got all the information out to you guys today, not just what I can remember off the top of my head. So, one of the sources I read said that dwarfen mead is made out of ant nectar instead of bee honey. Weird. Also, is it really mead if it's not made from honey? That's part of the debate. I saw that they foraged a lot of things that they put into it. So, you know, like different kinds of berries or root vegetables really rung out to me since that's been a type of mead I've been playing around with. And then one of the other things I saw was that a flagon of dwarf and mead can be used as a health potion. So that got my brain turning, that got things spinning in certain directions, and I came up with this recipe that I think is really fun. So I'm gonna put the recipe up right here while I take a drink of something tasty. So yeah, that recipe does look a little weird. It has sweet potatoes, it has beets, it has tea. So there's some different steps to this and there's some steps you have to do before we even start. One of the first things I wanna do is peel the vegetables and get them set up. Now I wanted one medium sized beet, but the supermarket I went to only had these insanely large beets. So I'm gonna peel this, cut it up into small cubes and that's it. We're not gonna cook the beet, there's no need to. Uh, the sweet potatoes. I wanna take two, again, medium-sized sweet potatoes, peel them, dice them, and we're gonna actually boil that till that the mesh sweet potato consistency. I have done a mead before with sweet potatoes, my sweet potato gingerbread mead, and it came out awesome. Uh, with this mead, I want to get that same body and some of those slight sweet potato notes I got in the original without having it sweet potato forward. So I really reduced the amount of sweet potato by a lot. We're only going to cook these in about six cups of water, and that's it. I don't want the majority of the liquid to be sweet potato. Speaking of things you want to do now while getting everything prepped is make yourself about two cups of tea. Today I'm using DNT their Shadowfell Slumber Brew. And this is awesome. If you can get a hold of this for this mead, I strongly recommend it. If you're not gonna make this mead, I, I still really strongly recommend you check out their products. Go to their website, I'll put it in my description below. They have a ton of really fun D&D inspired flavors. And as a company, they're just awesome people. I've met them at some conventions, uh, I have made a bunch of different meads with their products before. Now, the reason I'm using this particular one is, I really like it, but also if you read the ingredients, it has hibiscus, elderberries, black currants, and then some flavorings of raspberries and blueberries. All of which would be something I would think a dwarf might have access to while foraging. Um, I'm going to get some of the stuff prepped up, and then... With TV Magic, we'll be right back. So now that everything is in front of us and our mise en place is all set up, we can actually start to assemble this meat. So everything that's gonna to touch my brew has been sanitized. Please use a food grade safe sanitizer when brewing. It just makes it so much easier for you and gets rid of a lot of the factors that might cause an infection or some other microbes doing something in your brew that you don't want. I'm gonna get my scale. I'm gonna make sure it's torn, and that it's set to the right unit measurement I need. Now, one of the things I already talked about, I touch base and I'm coming back to it now, is it said Dwarven Mead was made out of an ant nectar. 
And as far as I know, there's no commercial ant nectars you can buy. And even if you did, I don't know how great it would be to ferment with. What I do know is honey makes wonderful wine in the form of mead, which is why we're here and watching this and doing this. So for me to call it dwarf and mead, it has to be at least 51% fermentable sugars, honey. That's just the rules of mead. I didn't make them, but I do follow them. However, since I know that it's not just honey that was used for dwarf and mead, I'm gonna do about one third of my fermentable sugars in the form of brown sugar. And I debated this a little bit. I was gonna go pure molasses, but molasses has a tendency to really overpower a brew. And I don't want it to overpower it. I just want it to be there. I want it to be a, something else is in this brew. So we're gonna do two pounds of honey and one pound of dark brown sugar. And hopefully since I have a much bigger container that has five pounds of honey, it doesn't take forever to pour two pounds of it out, but we'll find out right now. And I got 2.1 pounds of honey. So a little bit more than I meant to, but it's not exactly easy to weigh it out to the exact measurement you need. And I'm not taking any out of the fermenter now that it's in there. Honey aside, we're now going to open our brand new pack of dark brown sugar. If you have brown sugar that has gotten firm, if it's hardened over time, maybe air has gotten to it, it would still work in this. You don't have to soften it first unless you want to for the sake of a more accurate measurement. Uh, the liquid in here will dissolve the brown sugar while you're mixing it and probably not give you a hard time even getting a reading. So I wouldn't worry about it too much. And one quick note about the brown sugar we're putting in the mead today. Um, if you don't have dark brown sugar, you can use light brown sugar. If you don't have either, I would suggest just using all parts honey. Don't substitute it for white table sugar. It's not going to add anything to the brew. Uh, and you could just use honey to fix out, uh, felt the rest, keep the recipe going. I wouldn't overthink it. I just wanted to get a little bit of molasses flavor into this. There's a lot of flavors going into this brew today and they're all going to mix and mingle as it ages and ferments and all that other stuff. But you don't need anything neutral like white sugar in it. It wouldn't do anything besides raise the gravity. So in that case, I would just stick to all honey, but we're going to do a little bit of brown sugar and see how that turns out. All right, now that we got all the fermentable sugars, I want to mix it a little bit. I'm going to mix it with that hot sweet potato liquid. I only have six cups in here, so I'm going to carefully and hopefully not spill it all over the place. Oh no, we're good. We're good. And I don't need the scale anymore. So that could also go away. I don't want to stress my scale out any more than it already is. All right, so now the reason I'm adding the hot liquid in here first is it's a perfect time to dilute those sugars and get them mixed into suspension. It's a lot easier to do that with a hot liquid opposed to a cold liquid. And we're just gonna give it a nice little mix. And we're going to keep mixing until it's fully dissolved. So if it doesn't feel like you've got a little bit of an arm workout from mixing this, then you probably didn't mix it long enough. You want to make sure it's as dissolved as possible each step of the way, because at the end of this, we're going to take a gravity reading. And if it's not all in suspension, if we didn't dissolve all that honey, we're not going to get an accurate gravity reading. And that could be problematic for a few reasons. One, maybe it's too strong. Maybe the gravity is too high and we didn't realize it. Maybe our yeast won't work in that situation. Maybe it's too low and we're not going to get anywhere near the alcohol tolerance we were looking for. And any other factors, if the honey isn't mixed in, it's going to throw off our OG reading. It's not the end of the world. Is it bad? It's not bad. It's just not what we're going for. We want to be as 
accurate as possible when taking our reading and it only happens if we mix this well enough. I'm now going to put the strainer back on top and add my hot tea liquid. And it smells awesome. You definitely get like those dried berry notes, those currenty notes. This is gonna be an awesome amount of flavor in this one meal. I now wanna add my beet. Now again, I only peeled and cut it. I did not cook these beets at all. And they're not really in here to give it a beet-like flavor. I doubt too much of it at this amount is gonna even come through. What they are gonna do is stain this meat. And after fermentation, it's gonna be this wonderful red color, like uh, almost like a ruby. And I like that because when you think of health potions, I always think of red potions as a health potion. So if this, a flagon of this is supposed to be a health potion more or less, if it's not red, I just feel like it's not doing it. They are a little bit more of an optional ingredient as well, but if you're gonna go and make dwarf and mead, why not go all the way and make a dwarf and mead? See what I'm saying? I also like to add my dried mushroom caps at this point. Now, dried mushrooms are awesome because they have a lot of flavors and nuances in them, and it does not taste mushroomy after fermentation. I feel the need to keep saying that because I know that when you hear mushrooms are going in something, you think, either, ooh, mushroom, or ew, mushroom. Ferment, uh, fermenting mushrooms does not, just repeat, does not give a mushroomy taste. However, I do have both a mushroom wine, mushroom mead, and advanced mushroom wine video out. And if you wanna see how those were made, please check them out. Really good content and really good recipes to make your first mushroom wine, if that's something you're thinking about. This is not that, but that did inspire part of this recipe. I now want to add water for two reasons. One, this is a, it's not cold water, it's room temperature water. But this is a hot liquid right now. I can't pitch yeast at this temperature. Uh, if you pitch yeast over about 110, you're killing the yeast. You're not actually getting any colony. And in a couple days from now, you're probably going to have to pitch more yeast because nothing's going to have happened. So we want to cool the liquid down. Also, I know with this particular fermenter, comes to a gallon right below this line. So I'm gonna make a little bit more than a gallon so that after I rack it off of primary fermentation, I'm gonna have about a gallon of liquid in here. That should be good. All right, we're gonna give it another quick little mix. And now some of my adjuncts. Now, this brew probably has enough nutrients on its own to go all the way to the finish line between the beets and the mushroom and all the stuff from the tea. But it doesn't, I wanna add a little more. So I'm gonna add a little bit of Firmex, which is my yeast nutrients of choice. It's the one I have most readily available and it calls for about a teaspoon and a half. That's gonna go right on top. I'm also gonna add a teaspoon each of pectic enzyme and amylase enzyme. The amylase enzyme is what's gonna eat the starch, or I shouldn't say eat. It's gonna convert the starch in the sweet potato and a little bit of the starch in the beet and make them fermentable sugars. It's not gonna be a lot, but it's gonna give me a little bit more of those essence of those vegetables. It's also gonna help to clear those out because the starches in the sweet potatoes are not gonna fall out of suspension most likely on their own. And then the pectic enzyme is because beets are full of pectin. They actually make some commercial grade pectins out of beetroot, which let's face it, it's in here. I want it to stain their brew, I want it to give it that red color, but I want those particulates to fall out. So this is a nice clear beverage at the end. So we're gonna add it right in. Give it one more really good stir, get everything incorporated, and then we want to take a reading. It smells really good already between the potato and the, I don't smell the beef. No, I do 
just smell the beet. So between the potato, the beet, the tea, we have some really fun flavors in here right now, and I think they're gonna work very well together after fermentation. So we're pretty much on the dot of 1.100, which is awesome. That's exactly where I was hoping this was going to go to. Um, and potentially, it's going to go to this amount of alcohol at the end. But more on that later. Add this right back in. And now we're going to make a few little notes. So I'm going to write... Dwarven mead and 1.100 and today's date. All you really need for beginner notes and that's so let's add the yeast. Today I'm using Lauvin 71B because it's a great yeast. It has an alcohol tolerance that will basically let this go dry it's reliable and I have a lot of it right now. I was gonna use Red Star Premier Rouge because of its color extracting abilities to maybe get a little bit more out of these beets, but that was the only reason I was gonna use that yeast for this brew. And that has a slightly lower alcohol tolerance than I really was hoping for. So I think the beets are gonna do their thing right on their own. I don't think I need to help them with it. If it becomes an issue, we'll deal with that when it hits secondary. So we're going to add our yeast. Now, you don't really have to mix the yeast in, and a lot of times it just makes more of a hassle than it's worth, but I'm not satisfied unless I see them all go under. But they will stick to everything. They'll stick to the sides, they'll stick to the spoon. So you really have to give it a good stir and try to get every bit of yeasties in there. If you go that method, and again, not exactly worth it, not really necessary, but I'm gonna do it. Okay, now I just wanna supply an airlock and lid. Make sure the airlock is filled with something a little bit stronger than water. So I use sanitizer solution in here. And really it's just because Everything that could possibly want to get in here is going to want to get in here. Ants, fruit flies, whatever the case may be. And this is just a nice little layer of protection because they can't live through sanitizer fluid where they might be able to live through swimming through some water. So just a little bit of extra security if you feel you need it. Use an airlock either way. Best tool for the job. I've talked about it numerous times. All right, let's get cleaned up. And I'll see you guys right back here. So, that's the base recipe for our dwarven mead. Now it's probably going to sit for around two weeks while it ferments. I'm not going to touch it in the meantime. I'm going to put a label on it. As I've said before, blue painter's tape. Label your brews with blue painter tape. It is amazing. It allows you to take the tape right off. It holds so it's not going to fall off. You have access to your notes. You can see right here, I have a former bruise tape here because a lot of times when I film these videos, I take it and I put it right here so that I know my start gravity, the start date, name of the brew, any other crucial information. And you're not gonna be sitting there scrubbing labels off of your fermenters for hours afterwards. Literally, you peel the tape off, you clean your fermenter the way you normally would, and there will be no residue on it. Most important part. Anyway, so yeah, this is going to sit for a couple weeks before we rack it and put it into secondary. I'm really excited about this one. I think a dwarf in meat is something I've wanted to make for a while. I think it's going to have very interesting and unique flavor profiles to it. And all around, it's just a fun time. I hope you guys stick along on this journey and see how it comes out. But I have very high hopes that this is going to be a really fun meat. Anyway, if you liked today's video, please do not forget to give me a like. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns about this particular brew, leave them below. I answer every comment I get, so 
I really look forward to seeing what you guys think and how you receive this video. And please, remember to subscribe because it's the only way you'll be notified when more of my content comes out and you can keep up to date with my new projects, looking at some of my old projects, that kind of thing. But, but that's all I have for Dwarven Me Part 1. I'm Phil. This is Phil with Facts. And until next time, guys, cheers.